Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, recording and reading on uh, risk management and introduction that sits within the portfolio management section of the CFA syllabus. You'll find that it is very much an introduction. There's nothing really in the way of calculations in this particular reading. It does talk through kind of the people and the processes and the kind of systems and the measurements all involved in the risk management process. So it does move with quite a, quite a nice story. First of all, starting off with the definition of risk management, describing the framework of that management as an overview, and then talking more in depth with regards to different aspects of that framework. So for example, the governance perspective, uh, the identification and measurement of risks perspective. We move through to then finish off with the kind of process that we can use to mitigate risk by completely avoiding it, or maybe using insurance contracts to shift risk away to other counterparties. So first thing we're going to do here is define the concept of risk management. So obviously risk is some form of uncertainty and the exposure to which we might have to that uncertainty. And if we want to generally define the risk management process, we can see there comprises of all the required decisions and actions needed in order to achieve organisational or personal objectives within tolerable levels of risk. Now obviously risk management can be done on a, on a large enterprise level basis you know, for, for a company for example, which is a lot of the kind of perspective that this actual CFA reading kind of concentrates on, but it also does refer it to the fact that you could be an individual who has a portfolio of stocks and shares that we should also kind of take into account the risk aspect of that portfolio. So generally on, on a kind of company-wide level, but obviously could be related to individuals and the investment process that they engage in with their portfolios. Now we'll see here with the risk management process, what we're trying to do, for example, might be objective for a company to try and maximize the firm value. And obviously that's going to involve a couple of steps. First of all, is we're going to find that there's going to be a risk governance who might be at a board level trying to identify and determine the level of risk to be taken. What we then need to do is say, well, if we've identified what we would like to take on in terms of risk, then obviously the enterprise at a point in time, the company will be experiencing an actual level of risk. So we need to go out and measure the levels of risk that are currently being taken. And obviously, if they're not aligned, then what we need to do as a third step is to go back and then adjust the levels of risk to be in line with what we would uh, have as an objective. So obviously, that's the overall then complete picture of trying to maximize the value of the firm. Now we'll see that uh, also we have a framework of risk management upon which we will kind of see several different components. You know, some of them are not as, as clear cut as, as you might think, they kind of overlap sometimes. But generally speaking, we're looking at the kind of first four objectives of this risk management framework that kind of fit into the risk monitoring mitigation and management step of the framework. So starting off very high level, you've got here the risk governance, which is where we actually define the goals that we would like to take on in terms of risk. And we'll also identify the authority. So we do have, do we have a, a chief uh, risk officer that has the ultimate responsibility for engaging in and determining the levels of risk that the uh, uh, enterprise is willing to take on does obviously represent those top level decisions um, at a board level in the risk governance step. Now risk identification and measurement represents the quantitative and the qualitative analytical core of risk management, trying to measure risk in different aspects. We'll see later on uh, measures of probability, standard deviation, beta, you know, linking into other concepts that you might have kind of come across in your travels of the level one syllabus. Uh, risk infrastructure is kind of centered towards the people, the processes, and the technology in place to try and track your exposure to the risk within the organization. Um, that would obviously involve kind of capturing modeling, maybe engaging in some sort of stress testing um, to try and identify the risks that um, an enterprise obviously is currently taking on. So <coughs> that involves capture and obviously trying to model risk at the same time. Now to find uh, policies and processes, um, trying to incorporate risk into the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Obviously we've got the governance on the board level, but obviously they need to filter down and then let the, the kind of people underneath know that obviously there are going to be um, risk parameters set in place that the company doesn't take on excessive risk outside of its objectives, of course. That could involve protection data. Um, protecting data could be exception handling. 
you know, if we've got a break in a settlement system, then we obviously need to have a system in place to try and um, kind of uh, very quickly m mitigate the issue, correct it so that it doesn't cost the bank too much money, of course. Risk monitoring, mitigation and management kind of pulls together the above points. When risk is not aligned with the organization's tolerance, such that it can then be actioned upon. So if it's not aligned, then obviously we need to adjust things so that it does become in, into alignment with the objective of the uh, business. Communication, of course, is also going to be important. Um, so we communicate to people on the kind of front line involved in the investment process to know that obviously they can only take on certain levels of risk, but also people in the uh, kind of your settlement process as well also need to be part of the risk management strategy because obviously risks are borne on an operational level, not necessarily from the factor of the market, which might be more external factors that influence the values of portfolios, for example. It can often come from within the business, not just obviously externally. Feedback is going to be important to that process, of course, because we need to improve and update. And obviously, by feeding back on uh, what's happened over the, over the last year, for example, can then allow the firm to make the relevant changes to improve the whole framework. Strategic analysis and integration. Effective risk management will improve the performance of the organization and increase the valuation of the portfolio of the organization. So it's trying to maximize firm value as a strategic reason as to why we engage in the risk management framework. Now, just got a couple of questions here. What we might expect, for example, might be to try and identify, um, given a description about um, one of the aspects of the risk management framework to then identify uh, what step it's most likely to come from. So it says here, which component of the risk management framework encompasses the response when risk exposures are not aligned with the risk tolerance of the organization? So if we've got this kind of non-alignment, then obviously we need to, to go back and obviously adjust it so it does sit in line with the business. Now, we've got here obviously three choices, risk infrastructure, you've got their governance, monitoring, mitigation and management. We'll find that, uh, and again the answer is on the next page, risk monitoring, mitigation and management does deal with the issue where it's not aligned. We've got RIFs, risk infrastructure, which is the kind of people and processes involved in the process. Risk governance, of course, we said was where was risk was defined uh, generally at the board level. Now, number two here, which component of the risk management framework encompasses the analytical element of the process? Um, choices are communication, risk identification and measurement, and the risk infrastructure. Well, of course, you know, looking at this, um, if we're looking at um, the analytical component, if you look on the previous page, the risk identification and measurement, it quantitative and the qualitative analytical core of risk management identifies B as the most likely answer. Obviously the communication of risks to the relevant entities, risk infrastructure, we said before, was the people and the processes. Now moving on into um, that risk framework and looking at the risk governance right at the top in a little bit more detail of course, it says here that risk governance is the foundation for risk management that involves the top-down process and the guidance that aligns the risk management activities of the organization with the goals of the overall enterprise. Obviously there's going to be several components that should be a clear focus when engaging in effective risk governance. So this first one here is clear guidance in times of obviously crisis, but also, and this is a clear point made in the curriculum, that during times of normality as well, is that we don't always try and obviously engage in risk management practices that are reacting to, uh, to risks that are crystallized. We should always try and constantly monitor our risk exposures so that we can mitigate them before they actually crystallize. So it's kind of a, rather than a reactive, we also want to be proactive to try and obviously um, create an effective risk management framework. Now, the um, risk management itself as well allows us to focus on the whole of the organization. So the risk governance will take into account different individual aspects of the business, but bring it into a much larger top-down approach to see how the exposure of the business as an, enti an entirety obviously um, um, has been identified. We have uh, sometimes 
desks within a bank that always opt uh, to, to, to opt to work um, individually is that we might find that they take on a large position in a particular stock as have, have other desks within the business. We find that the uh, bank as a whole has taken on potentially a large position that's outside of their risk tolerance levels. We always need someone kind of looking down on a very holistic approach trying to identify these potential risks if they uh, crystallize. Now obviously a regular forum is going to be important. It's got to be discussion about what risks the company faces ongoing, constant process to try and monitor it. So maybe set up a risk committee that obviously allows for um, those decisions and obviously responses to be made. Uh, the apportionment of responsibility is also going to be important. We have a clear line of defense of the roles and the responsibilities involved that obviously makes for effective risk governance. Now just moving down to uh, one of the next steps here, we've got the risk tolerance. Um, identifies the extent to which an organization is willing to experience losses and fall short of meeting its objectives, e.g. to maximize value uh, uh, and risk adjusted returns. Obviously what we're trying to do is to try and maximize returns within the confines of the risks that the um, enterprise is, is able to bear, to tolerate. So obviously there's going to be several components to try and um, take into account into the risk tolerance and the risk management process. First of all, focusing on the risk of the whole business will allow to identify, I guess, both internal and external risk factors to be identified. Um, allows for the dimensions risk to be um, identified as well. And we're going to find later on that um, you know, traditionally people said, well, if I put money into shares, they pose certain risks. If I put money into bonds, then they pose maybe certain other risks that could be distinguishable from equity. Um, if I invest into hedge funds and so on, that they may have their own unique risks. Now, what we also need to do is think that there's going to be lots of overlap between uh, the risks involved in these asset classes, that they're not just present in the individual asset classes, that we also need to kind of take into account there's a lot of interaction across asset classes and that risks actually kind of span across different dimensions rather than just by asset class. So, for example, interest rates would have an exposure on shares and bonds. And therefore, we should kind of look at our interest rate exposure, not just kind of on an individual level to a certain asset class, but as the entire entity as a whole, which we'll see on the next um, couple of pages. It says there, risk tolerance should be formally chosen before risks crystallize. Obviously, like I said before, trying to be proactive in the way that we um, manage risks. This helps an organization to set up risk strategies. For example, what hedging policies they might have in place to try and mitigate excessive risks. And also maybe, for example, exposure to currencies that we have set in place before the risk crystallizes what we're able to tolerate. Now, obviously, aligning the risk tolerance to experience. Um, governance guidance will allow the organization to identify where it can take risk and where it should modify or mitigate risk. Now, of course, um, the firm's trying to maximize value. So it has things that it will um, be an expert in and it should maybe play to its strengths. If we find that the um, business is exposed to a particular, particular risk in a product that doesn't have significant experience in, then of course that could be seen as a, a big no-no in the valuation of the business. So sometimes it's a case of trying to play to our strengths. We take risks in, in areas that we think that we have more knowledge and maybe try to mitigate risks in areas that we have less experience in. Of course, that's going to be key in trying to identify the risk tolerance that we're going to take on as a business. Um, the adaptability as well, you know, you think about um, industries being able to respond to particular risks. And of course, that sometimes decisions that we make, which are often dependent upon uh, the type of industry that we operate in, <coughs> sometimes can be very quick to um, take, or sometimes that uh, a number of processes have to be kind of, kind of um, taken in order to engage in a particular decision that a company is going to make. So sometimes it's not a case of just flicking a switch to kind of say yes or no to a decision for my business. Sometimes I have to lay plans in the pipeline that obviously that's going to take a number of years possibly for the business actions to take place, which obviously makes risk mitigation a little bit more tricky because sometimes the decisions that businesses have made can't always be reversed easily. So therefore we have to kind of take into account the adaptability of firms in the um, tolerance of risk that they're, that they're um, going to take on, of course. 
Now, risk budgeting says we'll quantify and allocate tolerable levels of risk using specific metrics. The risk budgeting process will help um, implement the risk tolerance decision. So if we're able to identify what we're able to tolerate in terms of risk, then obviously we need to kind of budget for that and then maybe look at the risks that we're willing to take on. And like I said before, is there's going to be multiple dimensions of risk budgeting. Now, there's nothing here in the diagram itself that you should specifically try to memorize, but just get a feel for that, you know, traditionally, a lot of people have allocated within the business by asset class and identified some of the risks involved to those particular asset class. You know, what are the risks of investing 70% into value um, stocks rather than growth stocks and some of the differences in risks between those. Maybe my private equity investments into the pharmaceutical industry versus manufacturing, obviously within that asset class poses some risks. Um, on the bond level, investment grade versus non-investment grade, hedge funds, what exposure do I have to derivatives, bonds and equity. But obviously, as a business as a whole, we might find that there's gonna be overriding factors that kind of drip feed into all aspects of those asset classes. Um, liquidity could be developed versus developing, interest rate exposure, currency exposure, inflation exposure, which could actually encompass risks in all of those asset classes. So sometimes it's not just a case of kind of allocating risk budgets to individual stocks and shares, that we need to monitor the overall exposure to the business as a whole. So it says that the evaluation of risk on a portfolio should consider risk exposures to the portfolio as a whole, as they're not usually confined to one asset class. For example, interest rates may impact both debt and obviously equity. Now, the next bit is kind of, kind of quite clear cut, I guess. What we're trying to do here is to categorize risk. First thing we start with is to identify a difference between financial risks and non-financial risks. Well, financial risks are ones that tend to originate from the financial markets themselves. We split them down into three parts. You've got their market risk, credit risk, and liquidity risk. Whereas the non-financial risks here, we've got risks that originate from outside of the financial markets, from the environment, could be the community, some sort of political risk, suppliers, customers of the business that also kind of interlink to create additional risks that an enterprise could be exposed to. So what we're gonna do is kind of go through each one of them. <coughs> Obviously important that you could um, identify what are financial what are non-financial, and then knowing maybe what each one represents within financial and non-financial. So starting off with financial risks, we've got, first of all, market risk. It says there, risk emanating from movements and stock prices, interest rates, exchange rates, and commodity prices, typically arises from changes in economic conditions. So it could be monetary policy decisions regarding things like setting interest rates higher or lower, and the subsequent impact on, uh, for example, share prices, bond prices. Uh, credit risk, risk of loss um, if a counterparty fails to pay an amount owed on an obligation, so for example, coupon payments. Also referred to as default or a counterparty risk, so sometimes known as other forms. The root cause come from weaknesses in the economy causing risk of bankruptcy. Company is on the brink of bankruptcy, then obviously the risk that they may not pay a coupon obviously starts to increase. Uh, liquidity risk it says their risk of a downward valuation. Um, it says that a price concession. You know, if you wanted to liquidate a share in your portfolio and you wanted to guarantee that you could get rid of it, then obviously one of the kind of concessions you can make is to accept the lower price to sell that stock for. So um, bid, bid and ask. Obviously, if we uh, look in the equity section, bid and ask represents kind of a spread difference between the buying price and the selling price. Now, if this is a broker, obviously they buy on the left, they sell on the right. As an investor, you buy from the price they're willing to sell at, and you obviously sell to the price that they'd be willing to buy at. And obviously they, they will suffer the difference between the two prices, so low to high. The difference there of two is known as the spread. And obviously that's, a, I guess, in itself technically a transaction cost. I guess the liquidity represents the risk of the spread changing due to changes in the market conditions. So if a stock becomes particularly quite illiquid, then you might find that the price that you're willing to, uh, you're able to sell at, maybe starts to go down. 
the price that you have to buy at is maybe significantly higher, which will cause the difference between the bid and the ask spread to change. So I guess the, um, the risk of that bid and ask spread changing kind of technically reflects the uh, liquidity risk that might be present in a particular stock or bond, whatever financial assets has been quoted on a two-way basis. Some of the non-financial risks we've got here, uh, first of all, settlement risk. Uh, you'll find in the book they do mention the term Hirschstadt risk after the kind of uh, bank that um, had uh, initiated this particular risk in the market. Um, technically, it says here the risk relating to settling of payments just before default. One counterparty fulfills their obligations on a transaction but fails to receive in return from the other counterparty. So... Uh, I'm due to make payment of uh, some money in order to buy some shares. I give you the money. Problem is, is that you fail to give me the shares in return. Now, I fulfilled my obligations. Obviously, there's a risk that uh, over the period of maybe a couple of hours, that um, some party defaults on their obligation that I don't receive in return. Obviously, that's obviously going to be a significant risk in the form of settlement. Obviously, that can be mitigated in many ways. Sometimes nowadays we might net off payments so that we actually only transfer net amounts between people that uh, are dealing with one another and also just to genuinely try and do it on a real-time basis. There's no point in me paying um, my side um, unless I know that you're going to pay in return. So let's exchange simultaneously that might help to mitigate the issue of uh, settlement risk. Now, legal risk says their risk related to the law. Major risk is that the terms of a contract will not be upheld by the legal system. You know, we wrote a contract on the back of a stamp. Um, a lawyer's taken a look at it and just kind of shake their head and say, well, actually, it doesn't mean anything. Obviously, that's a legal risk that um, is imposed. Compliance kind of links to the above, I guess, encompasses regulatory accounting and tax risk. It deals with the conforming to policies, laws and rules and regulations that are set out by authoritative bodies and governments and obviously there's a risk that things will change going forward so from a compliance perspective we need to make sure that we follow the relevant rules and restrictions that are present um, in the jurisdictions that we operate. Uh, model risk, the risk of valuation error arising from improper use of the right model or the use of the wrong model. So sometimes you know, it could be the fact that the inputs that I've used into the model are complete, complete garbage, garbage in, garbage out. The model might actually be useful, but obviously it's only as good as the inputs that you put into it. Or it could be a fact that the model is just plain wrong. So obviously, closely related concept there is tail risk. This is where more extreme events, the tail of a distribution occur than what would be expected in the model that was maybe used. You know, for example, if we use assumptions about a normal distribution, we actually find that uh, maybe um, it wasn't normally distributed, that actually extreme events occurred with a, a greater... Um, um, frequency than what was identified initially for our probability models, then maybe that's the case that we've um, used the wrong distribution in the model that we've used to identify the risks for the business. Now, operational risk, it says they're risk emanating from the people in the process that combine to produce the output of an enterprise represents most of the internal risk faced by an organization. So for example, some crazy rogue trader gets himself into a spot of bother and sort of compounds the issue by not owning up to um, maybe some of the misdemeanors that they carried out. Sometimes that could be a snowball effect. So we need to also be able to mitigate some of the operational levels um, from within the business that we can uh, identify any rogue traders sooner rather than later. And they don't have the ability to kind of sweep some of those losses under the carpet and just um, hide them from the enterprise as a whole. Um, obviously, yeah, there's some quite notable examples in the past where that may have been the case. Non-financial risks kind of continues. Solvency, the risk of an organization failing because it's run out of cash, even though it might otherwise be solvent. So some kind of link to funding sometimes is that you might be a hedge fund, you've engaged in lots of leverage, you use lots of derivatives, and that um, you know, positions have gone against you because there may be market movements, and that uh, you're unable to kind of, kind of source some funding in order to meet things like margin calls, in which case that's going to be a form of solvency risk. It says there can be mitigated by using less leverage, having access to stable sources of funding, and the use of specific models to monitor your solvency risk. Uh, health risk, obviously kind of starting to move towards individuals, I guess, Primary non-financial risk for individuals, 
affected by lifestyle choices, smoking, getting exercise and so on. Uh, mortality and longevity kind of linked to, um, I guess, um, using your financial resources to live. There is mortality risk, which is the risk of dying young, um, whereas a longevity risk relates to outliving your financial resources. So uh, if, you, if you live for too long that was anticipated during your retirement, you run out of financial resources, obviously that's going to be a particular risk to you. Mortality, obviously, if you die too young, you've got resources left over that maybe you could have spent more knowing that uh, you, you would have had a shorter life. So obviously there's going to be two-sided to that, and obviously um, mortality and longevity risk. Uh, the property and casualty risk arise from life-changing events such as fires or natural disasters. Now, risks do not arise independently does mention a little concept here with regards to the wrong way risk, uh, where exposure to a counterparty could be um, positively related to the counterparty's credit risk. You know, sometimes it's that uh, you get a double whammy during a losing position. Um, I could be dealing with um, an Italian counterparty. Um, I ask them to put down collateral to back them up, so to kind of protect myself from the credit risk or the exposure to this Italian counterparty. Um, they deposit with me some Italian government bonds, and obviously there's gonna be a strong correlation between uh, maybe that Italian um, client of mine versus the collateral that they put down, that maybe um, there's a link between uh, the collateral that's put down and the counterparty, that uh, when the, um, I don't know, the Italian market maybe suffers, that has an impact not not just on the kind of credit risk of the counterparty that I deal with, but I also have the potential issue that there could be a negative impact on the collateral that's been put down to kind of back it up. So I need to take into account some of the fact that there's often a relationship between um, the collateral that's put down to protect myself from credit risk and the actual entity that itself that I'm trying to get credit risk protection from using this collateral process. So the resulting total risk face can often be worse than the individual risk that could have been encountered otherwise. Because interactions of risk are often hard to identify, it can actually be quite um, difficult to achieve. You know, I, I, to identify there's a, a relationship between Italian um, client versus Italian government bonds is obviously quite explicit. You know, but um, if it was something that I didn't actually identify that there was a relationship between, then obviously that could uh, be a way that I get exposed to this wrong way risk. Sometimes the correlations between collateral versus client are not always as explicit as they might seem. Uh, so here we go, a couple of questions to kind of break this up. It says here, trying to identify the risk measures. We said, uh, which of the following best describes a financial risk? And we've got the risk of loss if the counterparty fails to pay an amount owed on its obligation. Yep, that's definitely fine. Um, risk, that would identify, I guess, uh, a credit risk, which is an example of a financial risk. Uh, B there, risk emanating from the people and the processes that combine to produce the output of the enterprise. I think that's trying to describe the operational level, which was a member of a non-financial risk. Uh, the risk of valuation error arising from the improper use of the right model or the use of the wrong model was uh, what we called a model risk, which is an example of a non-financial risk. Uh, which of the following best describes the wrong way risk, where exposure to a counterparty is positively related to the counterparty's credit risk? And obviously, we are, we're worried about um, the wrong way that we get kind of a, a, that double whammy of there being a, a, a kind of a clear positive relationship between the counterparty's credit risk and my exposure to a counterparty. Um, if we look at um, B, obviously it's not the negative correlation. C, the risk that arises when it becomes difficult to sell a security in a highly stressed market. That was actually linking into the liquidity risk that we described before. So again, you can see the answers on the next page. That second question, wrong way risk is where the exposure to counterparty is positively related to the counterparty's credit risk. Um, the others relating to the fact that it was liquidity risk for C and obviously not the negative correlation that we'd seen with the um, second example.